Next, we're going to move on and talk about organ transplantation. Now, depending on where the organ graft comes from, it may get a different name. If it comes from oneself, so if someone takes out their bone marrow and then has it re-injected into themselves later, we call that an autograft. If you receive a graft from an identical twin or from a clone, we call that a syngeneic graft. And if it comes from a non-identical individual of the same species, so human to human but not related, we call that an allograft. That would be the most common type of organ transplant. And then a xenograft refers to when a transplant is received from an animal of a different species. Now in terms of transplant rejection, there are really three different types you should be familiar with for step one. And those three types are hyperacute rejection, acute rejection, and chronic rejection. In addition, there's a condition called graft-versus-host disease, which is not really a rejection, but rather a complication of transplantation. So to begin, a hyperacute rejection is antibody-mediated, meaning it's a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, as we discussed. And this is due to the presence of preformed antibodies against the graft. So this patient who is receiving the organ transplant already has antibodies in their bloodstream against antigens that are present on the donated organ. And those antibodies are there before the organ even gets placed into the new body. And once the organ is sewn in and the vasculature is reconnected and blood flow is allowed to resume, within minutes, literally several minutes after transplantation, you're going to get occlusion of the graft vessels, and you're going to get ischemia and necrosis of the graft, and the patient will either require immediate re-transplantation with a new organ, or that organ is going to fail and they're going to take other measures, such as dialysis, in order to save the patient. Now, the next type of rejection is called acute rejection. And rather than occurring in minutes, this actually takes weeks after transplantation to occur. Now, this is not antibody-mediated, but rather is cell-mediated due to cytotoxic T lymphocytes against the received organ. Now, this is reversible if immunosuppressants are promptly delivered, and commonly we use OKT3. What's going on here in terms of a histological basis is going to be vasculitis of the graft vessels with a very dense interstitial lymphocytic infiltrate. So again, this is primarily carried out by cytotoxic CD8 T lymphocytes. Lastly, chronic rejection is something that occurs to every single transplanted organ if given enough number of years. So again, this takes years to develop. And what's going on here is that you actually have both T cell and antibody mediated damage to the vessels of the new organ. And what's going on is that over time, class one MHC molecules from the donated organ are perceived by the host's T cells as a class one MHC self molecule presenting a foreign antigen. So this is a little bit different than acute rejection. In acute rejection, what was going on is that you had T lymphocytes recognizing the foreign MHC as being foreign, which is really a normal thing for your immune system to do. And if you're not properly immunosuppressed, acute rejection may occur, again, because these T lymphocytes are recognizing the foreign MHC as being not from your own body. Now in chronic rejection, this is a little bit different. So rather than the T lymphocytes recognizing foreign MHC, they're actually recognizing class one MHC from the foreign body that's actually being perceived as a class 1 self MHC presenting a foreign antigen. So that's a little bit tricky, but if you think about it, it should make sense to you, and you're able to see the difference between a chronic rejection and an acute rejection. I think sometimes it helps to actually draw out a diagram of what's going on here uh, to help you have a better understanding of the difference between the pathophysiology of chronic rejection and that of acute rejection. In chronic rejection, there's eventually fibrosis of the graft tissue and graft dysfunction. And again, if given enough time, these patients, like acute rejection, will require a new organ. Lastly, as I said, we have graft versus host disease, which is not really a form of rejection, but rather it occurs when with the transplanted organ is actually carrying along with it some white blood cells from the donor. Those donor white blood cells that came along with the organ by accident will start to attack the new host all throughout the body. 
But remember that any antigen that the recipient of the organ has anywhere in their body in any organ system is going to be perceived as foreign by the T cells and B cells from the donor. And so what's going on here is that you get severe organ dysfunction wherever this immune attack is being carried out. So usually these patients will have a maculopapular rash, they'll develop jaundice and hepatosplenomegaly, and they'll usually get diarrhea as well. This is most commonly seen in bone marrow transplant recipients, and it's also sometimes seen in liver transplants, the reason being both of those organs are extremely rich in lymphocytes. Now, sometimes we actually like to use this graft versus host effect to fight a patient's tumor. This is usually done in the case of liquid tumors, such as leukemia or multiple myeloma. What we do there is that we actually transplant a patient's bone marrow into the cancer patient, and some graft versus host disease will occur, but with that, you'll actually have the donor's white blood cells attacking the recipient's cancer cells. And so you get a graft versus tumor effect which can be extremely useful in actually combating the cancer. So graft versus host disease is usually a bad thing, but sometimes there is a potential benefit in a bone marrow transplant with some graft versus tumor effect.